Welcome back. We are here for the ninth episode of this study, which we have yet to come up with a catchy name for. It, oh. It's still just James and Aids Daily Bible Study. I'll think of something. We're, so we're working on it. If you've got good suggestions, we are all uh, ears for that. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll just keep kind of cranking things out. Uh, Aid, do you have any follow-ups from Genesis chapter eight? Uh, anything that we looked at? Again, we're in the midst of uh, we're in the midst of the Noah's Ark narrative. Yeah, so I made a comment about um, growing up, I was very aware of younger brother sins, but not as cognizant of elder brother sins. And someone just asked what I meant by describing sin in that way, which I apologize. Um, that is um, a characterization that comes from, you can probably explain it better than I can, but um, Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal, Prodigal God, where it talks about the story of, um, what's the parable actually called? So it's it's referred oh, to the lost son. Yeah, in Luke fifteen, it's titled in your Bibles usually as the lost son or the prodigal son. Um, and actually, Keller makes the argument that in the opening verses, it's it starts out. Jesus starts out the the parable. There is a man who had two sons, and we as it unfolds, we learn that there's several different movements to the story. But the it's as much about the elder brother as it is about the younger brother, and the fact that Jesus is teaching it to a group of Pharisees at the time is further indicative of the fact that that story is not primarily about the sin of immorality. Mm -hmm. It's primarily about the sin of using your morality to think that you're right with God, self-righteousness or the pharisaical behavior. And yeah. so elder brother sins are the sins of self-righteousness, whereas the younger brother sins are the sins of self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. That satisfy the summary? I think so. Yeah, uh, I think probably sometimes we use that shorthand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Luke 15 is where that's at. Tim Keller's Prodigal God is a of the books in my life that have like changed my life. Uh, Keller Keller has two of them. Uh, the Reason for God and the Prodigal God are, are in the top five. So. Actually surprised we made it this far without I think I've one already, of us I think I've already Tim referenced Keller. Keller at this point. So um, all right, so we're in Genesis chapter 9, and again, the encouragement is for you to read this through on your own at home, um, either before or after the study, using your own Bible. And here's my paraphrase, my personal summary for Genesis 9. God blessed Noah and his family. He told them to be fruitful and increase in number. God said that the beasts of the earth would fear humanity and that all the animals were now available for food just like the plants were available for food. Up until this point, everybody's a herbivore. Everybody's just plants, or uh, animals and humans are only eating plants. But now that the animals are available for food. The one criteria was that humans weren't supposed to eat meat that still had the blood in it because blood was a symbol of the sanctity of life. God says that if somebody kills another human, they too should have their life taken. Uh, since human life is particularly valuable as humans were created in the image of God. God again told Noah's family that they should increase in number and fill the earth. And God said that he established a covenant with Noah and his descendants, promising that they would never again, uh, he would never again destroy the earth like that. And the rainbow that was in the sky was going to be a natural sign that occurs uh, when it rains that serves as a reminder, a promise of what had happened but also what would not happen again. Uh, we're then told that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah planted a vineyard and became drunk from its wine. Uh, he was laying naked in his tent. Ham saw it and uh, told his brothers to come and, and find the humor in it as well, but Shem and Japheth instead came into the tent and covered their father out of respect for him. When Noah woke up and when he found out uh, what Ham had done, his youngest son, uh, he said, Cursed be Canaan, which was which one of Ham's sons. Cursed be Canaan, and he will serve as a slave to his brothers in future generations. Uh, and then we're told that after the flood, Noah lived 350 more years, bringing him to 950 years old, and then he died. And that's our summary for Genesis 9. Is that why people say, don't be such a ham, if you're acting kind of silly? I think that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Sure I think being a ham from. has nothing to do with. I don't know where it comes from. It sounds rather silly and stupid to me, but I don't think it has anything to do with it. Because he was like acting goofy. I could be entirely <laughs> wrong on that. And fortunately, there's an, an internet to help figure that out. But uh, yeah, you can get back to us with us if you have any insights on what being a ham means. But 
Uh, any I other? I don't think I realized that people were herbivores before the flood. I actually thought it was before the fall. Like, I thought after the fall that was something that changed. I didn't mm. realize it was after the flood. Yeah, no, God makes a clear distinction here. And, um, and you know, why exactly now? Again, there's probably a couple different reasons, but there's already, he's starting over with the world, but there's already sin in the world, and therefore animals are already dying. Mm -hmm. Whereas that was not the case when he first created right. the world. And therefore, if animals are already going to die, he um, probably, he's saying, well, there's gonna there's benefit to humans uh, potentially for eating them, and therefore you have a, a freedom in doing so. Mm -hmm. So I know that's still a debated thing in nutrition today, whether or not animals are, or certain animals are healthy to eat or not, but... Um, uh, God is at least making it permissible here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, our first thought for today, first devotional thought is the value of life. And we see here again, the human and animal death is the concept of it is reiterated. Uh, we see that humans are free to eat the animals of the earth. Uh, and yet probably the most important part in here is the fact that God goes out of his way to say, uh, if you take human life, your life then deserves to be taken. Uh, why? Because humans are created in the image of God and there's special value placed upon human life. Even the secular world understands this today. We've talked about the order of uh, beings before. So for instance, um, plant life is a rung underneath animal life. Mm -hmm. This is why we have different laws regulating how we treat animals versus how we treat um, plants. Mm -hmm. You can do things to plants that you can't do to animals or you get thrown in jail for. Um, and the same is different. The rung above that is humans. Uh, we have laws for how you can, what you can do with animals. You can put animals, for instance, in a cage uh, for a while, but you can't do that to a human being or mm -hmm. you get thrown in jail for it because humans are a higher order of life. Uh, God is also suggesting, obviously, that he is the highest order of life. And uh, by the way, that's a convenient reason why humans want to disbelieve in God, because if you mm. can push God out, then we are the highest, you know, mm. we're, we're accountable to no one. We're on the highest rung of the ladder. But what God is saying here is because humans are created in the image of God, we have a special value that even animals, it's not that animals don't have value and plants don't have value, but we have a special value. Mm -hmm. And anybody who violates the sanctity of that life uh, has some deserving, is deserving of losing and forfeiting their life in the process. Now, this brings us into a thing that we've debated on a number of different occasions before, and I know you've been looking for the opportunity to do this. <laughs> <laughs> which is the concept of a Christian standpoint on capital punishment. So go ahead and give your take and your input on that. I am just not an advocate of capital punishment. I don't know how you can choose to end someone's time of grace. Like, that's not your place. So Christians are so, and rightfully so, concerned with, like, unborn life. And I understand there is a difference. Um, but, I mean, it's... I think I still think it's a sanctity of life issue. Either you're concerned with life or you're not concerned with life. So I don't know how you can say one is just horrendous and the other one is okay. Yeah. So your like argument... That, this person is sinful, yes, but this person is also sinful. Like that baby still has original sin and sin is sin, but you're choosing to end yeah. this person's... But there, there is nonetheless a difference between sin, the sin nature and willful mm -hmm. sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I'm understanding your argument correctly, mm -hmm. it's something along the lines of even if a human being takes another human being's life, that person seemingly would still have an opportunity to repent of their sins, mm -hmm. turn to Christ for forgiveness, and find true life. I'm like saying, the thief on the cross. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any kind of... Um, it also gets into what you think the purpose of jails are. Like, is this punishment or are we actually trying to rehabilitate this person? If you're saying we need to get this person away from other people because they're a threat to others, then okay, you need to do that. But to actually say like, nope, I'm now going to sit in the seat of God and I'm going to... You, We talked about before about how God is the one who sits in the justice seat and yeah. like you actually can't do that. Yeah. So the, the argument on the other end of the spectrum is the idea that the government is God's agent. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament has a number, of, specifically Romans 13. He says the, the government does not bear the sword for nothing. Mm -hmm. 
and the idea of the sword being an uh, an obvious kind of instrument not only of protection but also potentially like execution mm -hmm. and the idea that if the government mm -hmm. is acting on behalf of god and saying because this person has taken another's life or maybe multiple lives mm -hmm. that person the government can act in the role that god has given it to execute that person uh as well and to mm -hmm. take them like they have forfeited their right to live by taking somebody else's life mm -hmm. right that i think that's the argument approximately on the other side um, that's the argument. I also just find it inhumane. I, I, I just will never understand it, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, I understand your argument, Yeah. Um, but my personal opinion is that it's really not our place. We, could, we can punish or we can detain, but I don't know that you make that final step of evaluating when someone's life should actually end. Yeah, so this would be, I, from my perspective, this is a good example. I mean, somebody can disagree with me. I think this is a good example of, like, that is a political uh, argument where Christians could theoretically be in disagreement on, and you and I have talked about this for probably the entirety of our marriage, and I think probably been on, uh, even though, not, I mean, maybe you're a little more convicted on your side than I am, but I think... Uh, I think what we can, you kind of shave off what you can't say. Mm -hmm. I don't think a Christian can say uh, a person's life through the government can't be taken mm -hmm. if they've killed other human life. Because I think between what God gives us in Genesis 9 and Romans 13 and a couple other places, I think he has empowered the government to carry out that right mm -hmm. if they think it's in the best interest of society. On the other hand, if a Christian wants to say, yeah, but wait a second. I'm willing to pay the tax dollars to help rehabilitate a person so that they might get some gospel exposure. And we should do a lot with like prison ministry and stuff like that. Uh, again, that's really what Jesus on the cross is doing prison ministry with the thieves there. And um, that they might have an opportunity if Doesn't their life is extended. Like the more merciful route to take. Yeah, that's the balance of. So, I mean. Um, I, I think it's a slippery slope argument probably on either side. Uh, and the point is, I, th I think you can't say authoritatively one mm -hmm. thing or the other. I think you can say God has given us, theoretically as a society, the freedom to carry this out. Um, but what is deemed wise in that culture, in that mm -hmm. context, could theoretically be different. And, and we just, as Christians, are okay with that. We're free to vote in accord with our, our conscience on that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that is, you can tell this is a tension point amongst the Heinz. <laughs> we talk about this, on a couple things like this regularly. So, but the, the, the one thing that's undeniable in this section is the value and sanctity of human life. And we're, we're both, on both sides of the argument, we're making that, that case, I think. So the value of life is thought number one. Thought number two is the rainbow as a reminder. Now, God says it's going to serve as both a reminder kind of of the destruction and of his grace. And remember when God makes these covenants in the next coming chapters, we're going to see God get into this covenant thing with Abraham mm -hmm. and with people moving forward. And it's this covenant of grace. And it's, um, I mean, really on, on, on the night before he's executed, Jesus says a new covenant I'm giving to you. Yeah. And this like the before was a covenant of grace, but this is a covenant of even greater grace than it was before. And God's covenants are always gracious to us. And basically what he's saying is, yes, I have destroyed humanity. Um, and I'm going to come back to judge the world again. But this rainbow is going to serve as a reminder that I'm never going to bring about destruction like this mm -hmm. on the world before the end of time. The only other thing I'd add to this um, is sometimes, uh, again, if, if I'm a skeptic and I'm looking at this account um, because we know the science of rainbows and, and why it creates the optics, mm -hmm. sometimes skeptics will say, again, look, this is ancient people who don't know what they're talking about, and they think a rainbow is God's like mm -hmm. message for them in the sky. It doesn't say that God started rainbows in this account. It says, oh, yeah. moving forward, the rainbow after storms will serve as a sign. So we have nothing that indicates that rainbows aren't already in existence. Mm -hmm. He's simply saying when you see a rainbow moving forward, it will help you, it should remind you of the judgment that was brought on the world in the yeah. past and rebellion and the grace that God continues to show to us. That's a good point. Do you remember something you said in one of your sermons recently and I was like, you just made a great argument against capital punishment. And you were like, I knew we were going to say that. Do you remember what it was? We are back on thought number one. <laughs> If you're, it would be easy to miss that because we're technically on thought number two now. Do you remember? But we're rewinding back to thought number one. No, I don't. Okay, I'll find it. Okay. 
Yeah, and you can keep plugged in. Uh, by the way, if you're not following sermons at St. Marcus MKE, you can find those on iTunes or Google Play or wherever uh, you like to get your podcasts. Um, and of course, this is a good reminder too. Uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we, we live stream worship services on Facebook. We archive all our church's content at YouTube. And a ton of you have subscribed in the past week or so, which has been awesome. And I'm so thankful that so many of you are able to come along with us on this study journey. Um, but yes, the, the sermons are available at St. Marcus MKE, uh, which is again linked on our website to stmarcus.org. Anything else on the rainbow? Mm -mm. Thought number one, the value of life. Thought number two, the rainbow as a reminder. Thought number three, uh, we're going to call it Noah's fallen family. And um, so we, we talked about this a little bit last time when God reiterates this concept that every inclination mm -hmm. of the human heart is wicked from childhood. He says it before the flood, and that's kind of obvious to see because the whole world's rebelling against God. But even after Noah and his family get off the ark, remember, these are the believers, these are the worshipers. These are the supposedly righteous people before God. And yet God still says every inclination is sinful from childhood. And we see that actually playing out even in the, the leader amongst them, Noah. And Noah is not only does he drink, which there's no uh, issue biblically with that. Uh, that's a blessing from God, the blessing of wine and, and that alcohol, but he abuses the blessing. And that's really always what, what sin is. It's loving the blessing ahead of the blesser and abusing the, uh, the, the blesser's instructions for the blessing. And so he drinks too much. He gets drunk. So there's a first issue. And then his son, Ham, uh, essentially just defies his authority, makes fun of him, and tries to encourage other people to jump in on this action of making fun of him. I feel like he kind of deserved it. <laughs> he just got drunk and passed out naked. Um, uh, that Noah deserved it is probably maybe true. That doesn't make it right. Oh, well, okay. Right? It doesn't seem like such a terrible... Maybe I'm, like, culturally not understanding. Well, so it's it's clearly disrespectful. Yeah. And the fact that, um, like, there, you can see, like, what the Bible also gives us is a right way to have handled this situation yes, but the other brothers do mm -hmm. they they put the a blanket on their shoulders they mm -hmm. walk in backwards very clearly they're respecting uh noah as their god-given earthly authority mm -hmm. that's clearly what they're supposed to be but doing. then they told on him because somehow they told he found on. out yeah well yeah ham learns well which is not necessarily wrong either because noah is the head of the family and it's probably wise that he knows I don't think they're just trying to make him look bad. Okay. I think they're trying to be honest. So um, we see a bad spiritual leader, and the trickle-down effect of that is bad spiritual leaders tend to lead to bad followers. And mm -hmm. Noah is not leading his family quite properly and faithfully, and his kids, uh, at least one of them, is showing the effects of that. And the, the further problem is it's going to continue to curse the generation moving forward. And this is something that, I did not get growing up, I've commented on this before, the idea that like the sins of the father are passed down to the mm -hmm. third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but God shows love to the third and fourth generation of those who love and fear me. That I always thought that sounded so incredibly unfa uh, unfair. So like whatever your great grandpa did mm -hmm. is going to somehow negatively impact you. And then I... Only in like learned behavior or primarily in learned behavior though, right? Well, but it seems like that's what God is just announcing. Well, you know, just, if, if somebody sins, then the fourth, you what is fourth generation. Well, that's the thing is, it is the reality. So if you study anthropology or sociology at all, you understand that breaking patterns of the generations before you is extraordinarily tough. And therefore, if you have addiction issues in your family, like your uh, the, the generations that follow you are disproportionately susceptible to those types of addictions. And so, like, he's not saying, God is not saying anything that um, I, I think most psychologists mm -hmm. or sociologists would disagree with today. Like, yes, if your ancestors mess up, it is going to impact you mm -hmm. for generations and generations. So be very careful what you do today for the sake of your great-grandkids because they're going to be impacted by it, too. Even in all of this, even in, uh, you know... Noah and his family's rebellion again it's just it wasn't just the bad people out there and Noah and his family mm -hmm. and the good people in here all people are negatively impacted by sin 
evidenced by this behavior, it shows that God didn't choose Noah simply because they were good. Yeah. He, he chose Noah because he's gracious. Mm -hmm. And uh, the difference between the believer and the non-believer is not that one is sinful and one is not. The difference is that one is repentant and the other is not. Did uh, he make it into Hebrews, that chapter I really like? 11? The Hebrews? heroes of faith, yes. Ah. Uh, Noah is a hero of faith. And so God is still gracious to them uh, despite even their continued mistakes. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on Genesis chapter 9? No, I think that's good. Okay, well, let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the gift of life. Uh, not, not only do we have life, but we have your image placed upon us, and that is a privilege and it is a tremendous responsibility. Help us look at human life wisely, which means help us treat other people well. Help us uh, glorify your name as we bear your image. Uh, and help us remember your grace. Lord, uh, humanity has been so rebellious, including us, uh, and yet you have made a covenant with us of grace that you're always loving to us um, no matter what. You don't love us because we're lovable. You love us because you're simply so full of love and choose to love us, and we're tremendously grateful for it because that's what we need. Help us to live out of joy in that kind of undeserved love, and may it be to the glory of your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us for Genesis 9. We'll see you tomorrow, Genesis 10.